please join me in welcoming the Vice President of the National Academy of Sciences, Dr. Barbara Shaw. Well, I'd like to add my welcome. Um, this is an incredible pleasure uh, to be here and to finally attend a Distinctive Voices at the Beckman Center. Um, we, uh, members of the Committee on Scientific Programs who oversee the Beckman um, Distinctive Voices program, um, have watched the program develop over the last several years, and I think the one response that we've all had was of envy for the, all of, the, of you that live here in uh, Southern California, because the program is absolutely terrific. And so it really is great to be able to finally um, hear one. And of course, what makes it even more memorable for all of us is that our, own, that our speaker today is our own president of the National Academy of Sciences, um, Dr. Ralph Cicerone. Dr. Cicerone is well known to many of you, having been um, at the University of California, Irvine, for some 16 years. First as the founding chair of the Department of Earth and System Science, and then dean of the School of Physical Sciences, and finally as chancellor of UC Irvine from 1986 to 2005. In 2005, he was elected president of the National Academy of Sciences, and that's one of the highest honors and one of the greatest responsibilities that a scientist can um, have in the United States. He's also chair of the National Research Council, which produces some 200 uh, reports for um, in informing the nation on issues of science. Dr. Cicerone was educated at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. In his early career, he was a research scientist and held faculty positions in electrical and computer engineering at the University of Michigan, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Dr. Cicerone's research is focused on atmospheric chemistry, um, specifically the radiative forcing of climate change due to trace gases and the sources of atmospheric methane, uh, nitrous oxide, and methyl halide gases. He's been a leader in bringing forward the science of climate change. In 2001, he led a National Academy of Sciences study on the current state of climate change and its impact on the environment and on human health. And this was requested by President Bush. As the National Academy of Sciences president, climate change continues to be a focus. The um, National Research Council, under his leadership, has produced a series of studies under the uh, America's Climate Choices uh, Group. Dr. Cicerone has received numerous honorary degrees and awards, including the Franklin Institute 1999 Bauer Award for Achievement in Science. He received the American Geophysical Union um, Award in 2002, which was the Roger Reville Medal for Outstanding Research Contributions to the Understanding of the Earth's Atmospheric Processes, Biogemic Geochemical Cycles, and Other Key Elements of the Climate System. In 2004, the World Cultural Council honored him with the Albert Einstein World Award in Science. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the Russian Academy of Sciences, the Korean Academy of Science and Technology, and Academia Sinica. So he's been around a lot. He has served as president of the American Geophysical Union, the world's largest society of earth scientists. It is a real pleasure, and please help me in welcoming Dr. Ralph Cicerone. The title tonight starts with climate change seen from space and Earth's surface. I'm not really a space buff, uh, but I've become convinced the last few years that some of the most important data that we have are being taken by remote sensing. And I want to go through some uh, fairly current data as an update on what we're seeing, uh, the way climate is changing. Uh, but I want to start with a few images that are not part of the story. <clears throat> I just give you a sense of some things that can be seen. First of all, uh, various optical instruments or orbiting space can be used to see snow and ice cover. In this case, it's the South Cascade Glacier in Washington showing a glacier retreat in just a few year period when it was being observed. I should say that these images uh, <clears throat> came from classified sources and they've been processed in such a way that they are now suitable for the rest of us to see them. And I've had some help from other people or people in the federal government in getting these, and they're now becoming available through the U.S. Geological Survey for scientific purposes. Just to give you a feeling, uh, 
uh, I won't tell you much about the scale, but here's the Bering Glacier in Alaska. I think it's the case that about 90 or 95 percent of all the continental glaciers are seen to be in retreat for the last oh, 30 or 40 years. This is a, a depiction, a photograph actually, of the Beaufort Sea in August of 2001 and then the same date in 2007. Some of you may know that 2007 was the year that the most Arctic sea ice ever disappeared, well, just to give you a, a feeling of what can be done. But this is more than just gee whiz. There are techniques available to discern the height of these uh, ice uh, remnants, the way they collide with each other to map out currents. The pressure ridges give an indication of depth and various forces. Uh, this shows a scene off of Barrow, Alaska, where I think we're seeing things at about one meter resolution. So there's really a lot of potential, just to give you a feeling of what some of the potential is. But I want to speak a little more systematically about some much more, uh, much more specific measurements and what they're telling us. So here's an outline of what I'd like to go through tonight. I'm going to use a lot of slides, but the first topic is really what are we seeing? What observations do we have about contemporary climate change? And what I mean by contemporary is just that. There is evidence, of course, that Earth's climate has changed over geological history from time to time. For example, I'll mention later the last four major ice ages. Uh, <clears throat> it's not clear how many of those changes have involved uh, large parts of the planet, but of course we have historical records of things like the Little Ice Age in Europe and the medieval warm period. In many of those changes, though, the evidence of how large the ch changes were are not really available. They have to be inferred indirectly. Uh, but I'm going to focus tonight just on the last several decades. And what I mean by climate changes are temperatures of air and water, ice amounts, which are losses, and sea level, which is rising. Then I'm going to say it, this is not just gee whiz, that is, these are not just things happening randomly, that there is a very solid fundamental understanding of what's happening based on physical principles that can be written down into the governing equations and calculated out quantitatively, and I'll give you a couple of examples. And it's this kind of matching that uh, leads most, whoops, sorry, uh, that the principle is the, the Earth's greenhouse effect, which is a natural phenomenon being driven now by uh, growing amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And this is the much most, most likely explanation of why these things are happening. And then, of course, I'll, I'll mention, I'm sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. I'll mention the strong connections between fossil fuel usage and why what's happening now is going to continue and probably accelerate. But let me start with some real measurements of temperature. Uh, if you want to know what's happening with temperatures around the world, there are three or four major centers that are working with hundreds of millions of temperature observations. This particular set comes from the uh, Goddard Institute for Space Studies at NASA, where they keep track of a lot of climate data. And it's uh, every black square here is the annual average over the whole planet. So for example, this point is the average of all the temperatures on the surface of the Earth around the year 1925. And obviously this is 2010. Let's see, do I have 2000? Yeah, that's 2010. Uh, now zero does not mean zero degrees, zero Fahrenheit or zero centigrade. It's a reference level. It's the average of all the temperatures on the surface of the Earth over this 30 year period, 1951 to 80. Now, if you go to these kind of data at another government agency, the US, NOAA, and the, the UKs, they use a different 30-year averaging period. Meteorologists tend to like 30-year periods. So the, what zero means then is the average of the temperatures in 1951 to 80 over the whole planet so that anything above that is a warming, a higher temperature. These are degrees C, so obviously, uh, this is about a degree Fahrenheit or 0.6 degrees centigrade. And anything below zero on this scale is a temperature less than that. 
So what you can, and there are hundreds of millions of data points here, some of them taken by remote sensing from space of the air temperatures over the sea surface in distant places. There's a pretty good mixture of continental sites and oceanic sites with a proper planetary average. So what you see is that in the latter part of the 19th century, temperatures were running oh, uh, two-tenths or three-tenths of a degree centigrade below what they were in 1951 to 80, with some bouncing around. This green bar here represents uh, a measure of the uncertainty in any measurement. So you could say all this bouncing around was more or less with within a one, one uncertainty bar, except for a couple of warm years here. Then a slow rise from around uh, 1900 to around 1945, then a little bit of a cooling, and then a fairly strong, a very strong and more or less consistent monotonic upward movement in temperatures. Uh, so that's what the airs are telling you. Now, these data, there's so many data points, they're taken mostly by thermometers and with modern versions of thermometers that you can break down the data into geographical regions. So one of the first breakdowns is north of the equator, red, and south of the equator, blue. So you see that the two hemispheres don't behave exactly the same. In fact, the, in, the, in 2008 and 2009, the northern hemisphere was actually a little low compared to the previous few years, although still well above this reference period, 1951 to 80, these things are several de standard deviations above this average. But nonetheless, they were cool compared to the previous few years, whereas 2010 was back up. But in 2009, when it was cool in the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere was at an all-time high. This was the hottest year in the 130-year record. And as you look at the geographical distribution of these data, you see more and more patterns. But uh, the, the picture that this probably represents is that the planet is warming now and it's being forced, we believe, by the greenhouse gases. The southern hemisphere is mostly ocean and the northern hemisphere is mostly land. Land surface warms up more quickly, ocean surface surfaces more slowly, so the oceans are lagging this warming that's been impressed on the earth. That's probably what's happening. But this is just one depiction of the geographical spread of temperatures in four different panels. This is the annual average surface temperature anomaly, again, that is the difference from the reference level for 2010 and then 2005, which were the two warmest years on the record. 2010 was just slightly higher, but not statistically higher than 2005. And 1998, which was the third warmest year of all. And then a month-by-month -month chart of what those years looked like. So, for example, 2010 is the red here, and going into the month of December, 2010 was really way above everything else, and then December on the global average went down. But still, 2010 ended up to be the hottest year ever. Now, geographically, this false color chart with reds and browns indicates that the polar region, this is the North Pole region up here, and the equator across the middle, but in the reds and browns, you can see that the warming since the 1951 to 80 region is uh, measured in degrees up in the Arctic region, two, three, four degrees centigrade, which of course is as much as seven degrees Fahrenheit on the annual average. The places over the ocean, you can see are the lighter colors, like either no change at all or just slight warming because the oceans lag and there's more heat capacity. The centers of continents are getting warmer uh, and so forth, like the extremely hot year in Moscow last year. Although it's around here, it, they also had an extremely cold winter, so the annual average wasn't that much different in 2010. The point of all of this is not to remember all the details, but just to say that there are enormously detailed data sets on surface temperatures, and what they show is warming over the whole planet. So this is one of the pieces of evidence that what's happening now is unnatural, or at least unprecedented. That is, previous warmings and coolings have been limited to like one ocean basin at a time, or a very, very cold winter in London, but a hot winter in, in Rome, that kind of things. 
When you see patterns like this, which are the whole planet, uh, it's part of the evidence we have that what's going on now is uh, unprecedented and probably unnatural. Okay, what's happening in waters? Well, getting the water temperatures are actually more difficult if you want to do it statistically significantly because we don't have as, ma we don't have as many measurements being made in the ocean waters. Uh, we don't have commercial aircraft. We have, of course, commercial cruise ships, but it's hard to get high quality data from them. There are some naval operations and some scientific operations. So this gra graph was painfully constructed by a NOAA group, Sidney Levitas et al., published about a year ago. It's been now uh, independent people from other countries have also taken all the available ocean temperature data over the last 40, 50 years. And what they find is that this is now measured in heat content, but it's essentially the temperature of the upper 700 meters of the ocean. Because on average, it's that part of the world's oceans that are in contact with the atmosphere on a couple of year basis. If you go deeper than about 700 meters, the oceans are, it's older water that has not been in contact with the atmosphere for decades, centuries, and in some cases, thousands of years. So if you want to know what's happening to today's climate in the oceans, you're, you're interested in the top few hundred meters. So that's what that graph represents. And it turns out that the slope measured in joules per year is about 10% of the extra energy trapped at the Earth's surface due to the human enhanced greenhouse effect. So it fits the picture. The point is it's an upward trend. It's noisier. Uh, but there's another slightly newer data set which also confirms this. So the air temperatures are warming up at the surface. The ocean temperatures are increasing. The heat content is increasing. So let's turn then to sea level. Uh, some of you have seen this graph before. For about a 100-year period from 1880 to about 1990, the black curve shows that sea level averaged over the whole world was going up. The, uh, the color in the background here is kind of a spaghetti chart of the actual variability seen. At, this thing is, it's not me, it's just randomly switching. Uh, <laughs> The black curve shows the best efforts to obtain a global average of sea level rise over this 110-year period. And it was uh, obtained very laboriously by recording on tide gauges very primitive instruments, basically stakes pounded into the ground at the ocean continent margins around the world, where the, where the water levels are at high tide and low tide and getting the averages. And what's seen is about, oh, 16 centimeters, or about this much increase over 100 years. 16 centimeters is what, about seven inches, something like that. And, and yet there's a lot of noise, so the trend isn't that well determined, but certainly sea level has been increasing for about 100 years. The right-hand part of the curve, the red here, represents something different. It represents newer high-tech measurements made by radar ranging devices flown on Earth orbiting satellites. So if you look at it on this scale, it says, well, sea level is continuing to rise. The trend doesn't look that different. But when you actually look at the modern record in more detail, this is now the record of sea level rise recorded by a couple of Earth orbiting satellites, the Topex, Topex Poseidon, and Jason instruments, French and American. These data are probably better because many, many more measurements are being made over remote parts of the ocean, all the world's ocean basins, more precision, more sampling, uh, more often. And the trend is not 1.6 millimeters per year, which is what I just said the previous 100 years. It's now double that, 3.3 millimeters per year. Uh, and the trend is measured much more precisely and accurately and it, it's more representative. So these are better data. So uh, just five or six years ago, when we thought the sea level rise was half that amount, there was something else different. It wasn't clear where that sea level rise was coming from. About half of it was thought to be due to the, the fact that the seawater itself is getting hotter and that seawater expands as you heat it. Now, water doesn't expand very much when you heat it. But 
uh, enough that a small temperature increase of a fraction of a degree caused sea, sea level to rise on its own. But at that time, uh, we couldn't make the numbers add up to 1.6 centimeters per year. Now the correct number is three, I'm sorry, millimeters per year. Now the rate is double that, and there's some new data which allow you to say, gee, we can get it to add up now. So the picture has become clearer, and those data are from more ice measurements. Now the kind of ice measurement that I think all of us have seen in newspaper stories or maybe an occasional magazine is looking down on Greenland or the Arctic Ocean or Antarctica, and you can see the, the white snow and ice be beneath. And in general, it's true that that lateral extent, the horizontal extent, has decreased. There are all kinds of photographs of this, that there has been a pullback of the snow and ice formation, certainly over Greenland, and you can see it in the summertime, of course. Uh, this graph is semi-quantitative. It shows the orange perimeter is where the snow and ice cover was averaged over a 20-year period, 1979 to 2000. And this is the sea ice extent uh, f four months ago. Uh, this is now looking down on the, the Arctic Ocean. So yes, there's been a pullback. But what's more impressive to me, and I think much more interesting, is a quantitative measurement. And some of you have seen these data. Uh, Isabella Velaconia, in fact, is here at UC Irvine, and her colleague John Warr. These are measurements of the mass of ice on Greenland from a gravity measuring satellite, which is just fascinating. I'll mention how it works briefly. But what they show is when the instrument was turned on in 2002 through about the middle of 2005, the amount of, of mass of ice on Greenland is seen to be decreasing. So it's not just the horizontal extent, it's the mass. Now, uh, in fact, this had already been measured by radar looking down on Greenland determining that the height, if you sense the height of the ice formation over Greenland, the whole thing, you can sense that there's been generally a shrinking of height. But this measurement is completely independent. Uh, some of you know this, but there's a, 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 an Earth orbiting satellite system called the GRACE gravity experiment, where these two working satellites follow each other around the Earth, orbit after orbit after orbit, number one, number two. And they're linked together so that they know where each other are with a, a tricky positioning system. So when the first satellite comes over, say, a mountain range, it's slightly accelerated by the extra gravitational pull. The second satellite senses it, and then pretty soon it comes into that extra gravitational force. It experiences the same acceleration. And by processing all the data, they can map out all the deviations in the Earth's gravitational field from that of a perfect sphere. Okay, they do it extremely well. But if they keep going, they can see changes in the unusual mass below. And after a period of three years, in fact, they were able to see that there has been a loss of, of ice mass from Greenland like this. Well, one of the original criticisms, nobody expected this instrument, at least I didn't think it would ever work this well. But one of the criticisms was, well, look, this is only three years of data, and in the climate business, you really need more than a year. You need more than three years of data. So uh, last year, Isabella Velaconia extended the record for now seven years, and the downward trend continues, but now the best fit to the curve is no longer a straight line. It's accelerating. It's, a, in a way, a downward-pointing parabola. So there's significant detection of acceleration of the rate of ice loss over Greenland, and the record is now seven years. And she can separate this out to be South Greenland, North Greenland. The instrument is that good. In fact, they reported, the rest of the team reported, that they can sense the seasonal drawdown in the water in an aquifer underlying India. That's how they can see the seasonal change in the water in that aquifer. That's how good this instrument is. Now, for Antarctica, this is now the seven-year data record. Again, the best fit to the data is an acceleration in the, right, in the rate of ice mass loss. So here, buried, is that if you took the, uh, the, the average trend 
it's giving 0.6 millimeters a year of sea level rise. If you take the most recent number, it's more like one. And if you add up those numbers due to the ice mass loss over Greenland and Ar Antarctica, of course, it's only the continent because the ice that's floating in the water doesn't give rise to sea level change when it melts. Uh, now you can add up four factors and you obtain a pretty much exactly what the sea level rise measurements are showing. The loss of ice from Greenland, the loss of ice from Antarctica, the, the, the thermal expansion due to the ocean warming, and uh, uh, a less accurately known loss of ice from inland glaciers like in Peru and Europe and places like that. So you see that the business about climate change data is quite real. These are very solid observations done with independent methods that would make a physicist happy. In fact, they're done by physicists. So I'll go back now to this temperature record because I implied earlier that this 30-year record is somehow different. Well, it is different because the temperature is now being observed as a planetary surface temperature are higher than have ever been observed before in the entire record of thermometers. The, uh, they're being observed everywhere. It's not a fluke happening only in London or Melbourne. It's happening virtually everywhere. Of course, there's still year-to-year -year variability. That's why you need a long record. And getting into our ability to predict, there is no mechanism that anybody has identified yet that could explain this warming except for the greenhouse effect business that I mentioned due to the human-caused greenhouse gases. And I'll mention that now. So this 30-year period looks different. It's a more or less continuous upward movement into unprecedented temperatures, and it's happening elsewhere. Uh, but as I implied earlier, this is not just happening randomly. It's pretty clear that there are physical principles that underlie the change. You can write down the equations. They're very difficult to solve. But when you solve the equations, I'll show you what you get. Uh, but first, just a cartoon that I know some of you have seen. This is something that our friend Romanoffen developed many years ago as a cartoon showing the Earth's energy budget. What is it that, that could control a planetary climate? Well, it's the energy from the sun on the one hand and then the energy escaping from the planet, and those two are more or less balanced. So on average, day and night, we get 342 watts per square meter from the sun. And about a third of that is reflected immediately from light-colored surfaces, like, uh, is anybody here wearing white or yellow, something like that? When you go outside on a hot day wearing something black, you can feel it. You're absorbing sunlight. If you wear something white, you're cooler. And it's the same with the, the tops of white clouds. The, the, uh, any snow and ice surfaces down here reflect the sunlight immediately. So that's about a third of the 342 watts per square meter, 105. The balance is then about 237 watts per square meter. And to a first approximation, that much energy escapes the, space, the Earth in the form of infrared heat. This 342 watts is in the form of visible light. This, uh, this is uh, infrared, and that's roughly the balance. However, by the, the Earth's atmosphere has some natural gases in it, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and natural amounts of ozone, which interfere with the escaping infrared radiation and keep the planet warmer than it would be otherwise. I'm still talking about nature here for a minute. In fact, Strong proof of the greenhouse effect comes from other planets, and we try to calculate the temperatures of other planets. So for, for Mars, I'll start, we calculate the right temperature. We know how far away from the sun Mars is. It's a different number than 342 watts per square meter because it's a different distance, but when we, 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 we have a simple equation the sunlight energy multiplied by 1 minus the reflectivity tells you how much is absorbed, and that equals the rate at which a black body would radiate, and you can calculate everything in this equation is known except the temperature you calculate it. You do that for Mars and you get the right answer. Now Mars temperature varies from day to night, so uh, this thing is randomly moving. Uh, but 
to within five degrees or so, you get the right temperature for Mars. And the reason is that the atmosphere on Mars is so thin, and so few greenhouse gases, and such a small greenhouse effect, that this simple calculation works. If you try the same calculation for Earth, plugging in all the right numbers, you calculate that the Earth is frozen solid. <laughs> that the Earth is minus 18 degrees centigrade or minus 32 degrees Fahrenheit, in other words, 64 degrees Fahrenheit below freezing. As far as we know, the Earth has never been frozen solid, so something's wrong here. These numbers are very well known. These numbers are known, this one is known to within, say, 2%. This one's known to within about a half a percent. These are physical constants. So something's wrong, and the something wrong is the greenhouse effect. The Earth's atmosphere has enough thickness to it, enough carbon dioxide and water vapor, methane, and a few other natural greenhouse gases that and, and the clouds have to be included in the greenhouse effect. And when we do the same calculation for Venus, we miss by several hundred degrees. Venus is several hundred degrees warmer than this calculation would tell you because it has a very thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. And it's only when you take that into account and employ the greenhouse effect in the calculations that you can come close to calculating the right temperature. So, this is not only physical theory, this is fact. Now, the, the problem, and, and by the way, one of the first satellites that ever flew around the Earth with a scientific instrument on it in the early 70s looked down on the Earth and, okay, the Earth's temperature, room temperature is about, you know, 295 degrees Kelvin, I'm sorry for the units, 25 degrees C or, you know, 70 some degrees Fahrenheit. If the Earth were just radiating out to space without a greenhouse effect, the satellite would have seen this kind of a smooth curve. Depending on looking at the tropical Pacific Ocean, it would have looked about like that. And if it were looking at the Antarctica, it would have looked something like that. Instead, the actual measurements have these bite outs in them, these notches. And this notch happens to coincide with carbon dioxide absorption of infrared wavelengths. This notch happens to do with ozone absorption. So another kind of evidence that the greenhouse effect is real. There's, there's no mystery here. It was first proposed and the calculations done in the middle of the 19th century. Only now we have numbers to see its evidence. So why the big fuss then? Well, the big fuss is that the the, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the, some of the most effective ones, are increasing. Some of you have seen this graph, which is now iconic, uh, produced by our, our late colleague Dave Keeling at UC San Diego Scripps, where very laboriously, starting in the late 1950s, late 1957, early 1958, he measured the carbon dioxide amounts in air at uh, most of the way up Mauna Loa Mountain on the Big Island of Hawaii. Each one of these black dots represents the monthly average of measurements taken about every hour. The red graph is from, uh, from the South Pole. Uh, very laboriously had glass flasks with air in them shipped back to La Jolla and measured. So what you see is an upward trend. The in Antarctica, you see this fairly smooth red curve starting at around 312 parts per million, going up to around 380 parts per million. And the black curve, uh, more or less the same thing, a little bit higher in the northern hemisphere. It's now about 390 parts per million in 2010, but with a, an annual cycle. And many of you know that that annual cycle is due to carbon dioxide being breathed in and out of the living things on Earth. So in the spring and summer, carbon dioxide is drawn down out of the air by photosynthesizing plants, green plants, and, and photo, phytoplankton in lakes and oceans. And then in the autumn and winter, the carbon dioxide is essentially returned to the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide amounts go up under respiration and decay of organic matter the waste of, of living things. So a great deal has been learned from this graph uh, about carbon cycling on, on Earth, but the most important thing for our purposes tonight is that there's been this rather abrupt and large change in the carbon dioxide amounts in the Earth's atmosphere. 
Measurements like this are now being repeated all over the Earth in, in any way that would make an analytical chemist happy. They can be done that well. Uh, so there's no question about them. And there are six or seven lines of evidence that convince you that this carbon dioxide is coming from human fossil fuel burning. burning. The isotopic content of the carbon, the geographical patterns, the amounts, the, the rates of change, and, and then comparison with in wind motions, the amounts taken up by the ocean, and so forth. So uh, the, I'll come back to it later, but the only uh, uncertainty here is how much deforestation is adding to this carbon dioxide increase. I'd say the best available information is that about 85% of this increase is due to fossil fuel burning, and perhaps 15 percent, plus or minus 10 percent, is coming from deforestation. The direct burning of trees and the uh, loss of organic matter from the soils where the, the land is being cleared, mostly for agricultural purposes. Uh, just as a, a sample of other greenhouse gases, Nitrous oxide, laughing gas, is also being measured very well around the world now. It's increasing similarly. The data actually go back much earlier than this, but this is kind of a pretty colored chart from Ray Weiss, who happens to be working with people at Georgia Tech of nitrous oxide amounts. So the greenhouse gases are increasing. The nitrous oxide picture is not as clear. It's not so clear where it's coming from. It probably has five or six different human-caused uh, activities that are releasing extra nitrous oxide, mostly having to do with synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. For a while, the production of nylon using the original uh, industrial chemical pathways through adipic acid to make nylon were releasing rather large amounts of N2O, but the nylon production industry has because of this problem, move to other methods. But it's not so simple with nitrous oxide. Okay, let me talk now about the last three or four ice ages on Earth. This graph first came out, uh, this was reproduced from Jim Hansen and uh, Makiko Sato in 2004, but the graph was from the late 90s from a French group that was part of an international expedition to Greenland and Antarctica where they drilled down in very, very deep ice in Greenland and Antarctica, so deep that the ice was as much as 450,000 years old. Now, determining, if, if you take a cylindrical core down into ice and pull it out, it's not that easy to date the ice. In the, in the most recent 50 or 100 years, you can actually count the layers. You can see it. But as you go down deeper and deeper, the ice gets more and more compressed, and time gets compressed. So it's harder to, to slice out a layer and say that's an individual year. In fact, the time resolution vanishes, and you get into time resolutions of hundreds of years, and different dating methods have to be used. But the point is, this dating is, is very good. The ice experts have worked out the characteristics of ice cores where can, they can get the most reliable dating. So this figure really does mean 140,000 years ago, and this one really does mean 20,000 years ago. So on this kind of red and blue graph, we see several things. On the top scale is carbon dioxide amounts, again, measured in parts per million. So during, and the blue is the temperature that was inferred to have taken, to have been, uh, in place at each point with time. And that was inferred by the isotopes in, in hydrogen and oxygen in the ice. So when the blue curve goes down, it was cold. In fact, about six degrees centigrade colder than now. When the blue curve goes up, it's warmer like we are now. So we're in this uh, warmer time now, cold, the interglacial warm period, 
the previous ice age about 145, 150,000 years ago, a warm period, the previous ice age about 250,000 years ago, interglacial warm period, the previous glacial period about 350,000 years ago. This record has now been extended back nearly 800,000 years, but I'll just show this one for simplicity, and it was the really breakthrough measurements. Now, by taking these ice cores, which are known to be, let's say, 20,000 years old, into the lab, and you, these people can extract the gases that were trapped in the ice at the time the ice was formed. You can do it two ways. You can crush the ice in a vacuum and suck the gas out, or you can actually melt the ice. And for a water-soluble gas like CO2, it's a little risky, but they can still do it. But either way, they get this pretty much the same answer. So, when it was cold, the CO2 amounts were about 180 parts per million. And I just showed you where we are now is 390. When it was warm, before the industrial age began, it was about 270 parts per million, say 100 years ago. Uh, the previous ice age, 180, 280, 180, 280, 180, 280. So the last four cycles or so of planetary ice ages, carbon dioxide amounts were in a natural range of 180 parts per million, 280 parts per million cold 180, warm 280, and so forth. Uh, the second graph here is methane amounts. The same thing. When it was cold, methane amounts were like one-third of a part per million. When it was warm, two-thirds. When it was cold, one-third. When it was warm, two-thirds. Blah, blah, blah. Now we're about 1.8 parts per million, or about five times the amount of methane seen at the geological ice ages, and about two and a half or three times what was seen in between. So this is strong evidence that what we're seeing now in the greenhouse gas composition of the air has, hasn't been seen before. Now, hundreds of millions of years ago, during the Carboniferous period when the organic matter that gave rise to oil was laid down, there is certainly evidence that the Earth was warmer, some continents. But it's indirect. I prefer the direct evidence. It's probably right that the Earth was warmer and there was even more carbon dioxide then, but we don't have direct evidence. I just want to stick with this direct evidence. And it shows that over the last four uh, planetary ice ages and warm periods, the range in which carbon dioxide amounts were and methane amounts is just not where we are now, much less. So I said earlier that the carbon dioxide increase is from human activities as I said, about 85% from fossil fuel burning and about 15% from deforestation. So, we know that the amounts of these gases in the air are more than before, and we also know they're greenhouse gases. Okay, it's re relatively straightforward to go and calculate what impact they're having on the Earth's energy budget. Uh, any spectroscopist in the group knows that the spectroscopy of these gases are extremely well known to whatever level of detail you want. And you take them into the laboratory, you measure them, you calculate how they interfere with infrared radiation, and you can convert that to this figure that we call radiative forcing or the energy trapping near the surface of the Earth that's accomplished by this extra amount of carbon dioxide added in the last few decades, the extra amount of methane added in the last few decades, nitrous oxide, and a whole class of fluorine-containing chemicals, not only the chlorofluorocarbons on which Sherry Rowland can, did so much, but also some other fluorine-containing chemicals. If you add up all these figures, it says that we're now changing the planetary energy budget, and therefore the climate. We're changing it by more than 1% in a period of a few decades. Now, we have a couple of astrophysicists here tonight who know a lot about how stars evolve, and there is no information of any kind that suggests, either from observation or theory, that any star has evolved 1% uh, in 40 years. It's, it's more like uh, 50 million years or something like this. So this is a very rapid change in the Earth's uh, energy budget. Now, what does it all mean? Well, that's really the tough part of it. How much, uh, certainly, first of all, I want to tell you that the changes are going to continue. Uh, and to give you a little bit more perspective over the energy. I already said the energy absorbed from sunlight is really the large number, 237 watts per square meter, 
The extra heat trapped by these greenhouse gases is now about 2.7 watts per square meter. And this thing is bizarre. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, if you take all of the energy that humans are using from burning of coal, natural gas, oil, wood, nuclear power, hydrothermal energy, sunlight, uh, wind energy, tidal energy, geothermal energy, and you say, let's just spread that over the whole Earth, how big would that number be? Well, it's pretty small. It's 1 40th of a watt per square meter. Now, in cities, the number is actually bigger, and that's what gives rise to the urban heat island effect. But if you spread it out over the whole surface, it shows that it's 1 100th time as big as this extra greenhouse effect, which in turn is a little bit more than 1% of the, the sunlight energy. This is a large perturbation. This is small. It just shows you how effective this greenhouse gas is in amplifying the effect of what humans could do otherwise. So if you somehow wanted to warm up the planet, this is not the way to do it, simply by burning more coal and oil and nuclear power. You don't get there. It's by using the leverage of the greenhouse gas that you can change the planetary energy budget. And that's what we're doing. Just, I want to show you just one kind of calculation. And this is uh, to emphasize that the most quantitative calculation that anybody's capable of doing is, for example, can we simulate the actual temperature record, which is the black curve in both of these. This is the actual temperature record, which I showed you in different form earlier at surface temperatures. When we take into account all the natural forcing we know about, volcanic changes, uh, small changes in the sun, uh, it's this green curve, whereas the observations are going up, the green just bounces around, a little bit of volcanic action here and there, but the observations are now fairly high above what can be simulated. It's only by including the greenhouse gases and the other things we know about that we can come close to calculating what's actually happening. There's, now you might say, well, you know, there's one other player here. The sunlight is so important. And I said that there's something special about this last 30 years, and the other something special is it's the only time in human history when we've been able to measure the output of the sun well enough to be able to say whether or not it's changing. And the answer is it's not. There's an 11-year cycle of the output of the sun, which is, uh, here we go again, the output of the sun goes up by a small fraction of a percent and down again every 11 years. This last two or three years has been at an unusually low level, at least as measured before. It's been a little bit stuck on the bottom. So we expect, in fact, a small cooling effect due to this slight decrease in sunlight. But this peak-to-peak -peak amplitude from bottom to top at the surface is 0 0.2 watts per square meter. And I've already told you that the greenhouse effect due to the human increased gases are 2.7 watts per square meter, 16, 15 times larger. Uh, this one is oscillatory up and down. The human caused greenhouse effect is just continuing steadily, not going down, going up. So those of us who wanted to say that the sun was causing these observations of the last 30 years or so, can't do it anymore. Oh, by the way, these data are from Judith Lean, who's a physicist at the US Navy Research Lab, and Klaus Freilich in Switzerland. And they have strung together several satellite measurements. So once again, observations from space are providing quantitative information that are turning out to be, uh, I would say, dispositive. They're telling us what's happening. Uh, I want to link it now to the fossil fuel carbon usage. I said earlier that one of the pieces of evidence that the carbon dioxide increase is due to fossil fuel burning is the amount. Well, the amount of release of carbon dioxide from our known amounts of carbon uh, fossil fuel burning have increased like this over the record of measurements. This, these people from Oak Ridge have actually tried to extend the record back to 1750, but you see it's essentially zero on this scale. The, the, the rate of release in the year 2007 was, uh, what is that? Eight billion tons 
of carbon in the form of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning. That's not all of carbon dioxide. This is just the carbon part of it. So 8 billion tons. Now, what's showing up in the atmosphere is actually a little bit less than that because the ocean is taking up some of this extra carbon dioxide. You would have to add on to that, though, another 1.5 or so, or 1 billion tons of carbon from deforestation to see the big perturbation. But this number matches to within a factor of two of what's seen in the atmosphere. When you add in the isotopic evidence on the patterns is where the extra evidence comes from, and the time, the time shape, of course, showing the carbon dioxide increase. So this, by the way, this includes a couple of percent contribution from cement manufacturing, which releases carbon dioxide. Well, let's look at some energy data to show you the reality, the imperative, the uh, momentum of this release of carbon dioxide. These data, obviously, to the left of 2008 are historical, and to the right of 2008 on this graph were predictions. So this is history. These are projections. These are uh, energy, uh, world primary energy consumption measured in these god-awful units of British thermal units, or <laughs> quadrillion ones, so you call them quads for short. So in the year 1970, excuse me once again, in the year 1970, the world used a little over 200 quads of energy from hydrothermal, uh, car, coal, oil, gas, wind, biomass burning, nuclear power, etc. That number had doubled by about the year uh, 2002, which is not surprising. World population did the same thing. That's only about a 3% per year rate of increase, or 2%. But one of the things that you began to see different, though, is the blue part of every yearly uh, cons uh, consumption data was the amount of energy consumed by mature market economies like the United States, Canada, Japan, Western Europe. The red part of each uh, bar shows the amount of energy consumed by transitional and emerging economies. And if you project into the future, you see that the projected growth rate is that that figure would have been tripled by about uh, oh, five years from now, six years from now, and that most of the growth is due to the emerging and transitional economies. And one example, of course, is China, where this is a table just to show you one of the the human uses of energy. Uh, these data are the coal-fired power capacity to produce electricity in three countries, the United States, China, India, and the world. So in the year 2003, in the United States, we have 310 gigawatts of electrical capacity from coal-fired power plants. And the projection was that that figure would rise by about 3% to 319 gigawatts in 2010, and up by about 50% by the year 2030. I can give you references later. China was projected to go from about 240 to about 350 and so forth to 785 gigawatts by 2030 in India, so forth. Well, we of course were hearing stories that China was building 50 gigawatts, 60 gigawatts, 80 gigawatts, of electricity capacity from coal-fired plants per year. So I talked to the US Department of Energy people, the, the Energy Independence Agency, Energy Information Agency, and I helped to convince them to update this figure. So in 2008, they updated the projection. This is just two years later. This is the new projection. And even with this strong growth in coal-fired electrical capacity in China, you still, there's evidence that they don't have enough electricity. They're still uh, not able to do all the manufacturing for the demand that they're trying to satisfy in their own population and for the rest of the world. So this is one measure of the demand. And of course, if we continue to use fossil fuels for 80 to 85 percent of all world energy, uh, the the impact on carbon dioxide emissions is going to be commensurate. Uh, I have one more graph to show you. You remember the heat wave in the year 2003 in Paris and Western Central Europe. Uh, this graph is the temperature difference from normal in degrees centigrade in this geographical grid of West Central Europe. So 
Zero means an average July temperature, and the black curve shows what the actual measurement showed in West Central Europe for the July average temperature for the 20th century, and then in the year 2003. So this was the average July temperature actually measured, and you remember that there were like 12,000 additional deaths in Paris attributed to the heat wave in July of 2003. Uh, largely older people living in non-air conditioned places, didn't, they weren't hydrated well, but there was a lot of extra deaths. It was an unbelievable number, but it turned out to be believable. Uh, this heat wave was thought to be about a one in 300 year event. But as the planetary temperatures increase, and this is just one calculation of the way that the temperature increase is going to continue, certainly the next 20 years or so is pretty sure. What happens after that depends a lot on our uh, fossil fuel usage. But that one in 300 year event becomes a one out of two event in about the year 2040 or 2045. So this is the kind of evidence we have that we should start preparing and adapting for uh, unavoidable changes, let alone trying to hold them back a little bit. I don't want to dwell on that too much, but it's, it's pretty illustrative, I think. A, a Japanese friend of mine, and this I think is my last slide, prepared this cartoon, which I like very much. It's a, we don't really know what a dangerous level is, but it's obviously a bathtub filling up with a spout which, of water which represents the carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning. And I already told you that the amount two years ago was eight billion tons a year of carbon, not seven, but let's call it seven because that's what his figures were at the time. So the incoming flow of water represents seven billion tons of carbon a year. And the drain is the natural ability of the planet to absorb that extra carbon dioxide. And we know from decades of measurement that the oceans are taking up about two billion tons of carbon a year, and the land may be one. Now there's a completely independent way that these measurements can be uh, tested, and that's through oxygen measurements due to Ralph Keeling. And completely independent line of reasoning gets about the same numbers. So as best we can tell, it's, it keeps happening, folks. As best we can tell, the input is seven or eight, maybe another one nine from deforestation, and the outflow is about three. And that indeed is why the annual increase in carbon dioxide is a little bit less than the annual input from fossil fuels. But what it tells you is that the water level will keep rising until this outflow equals the inflow. So this is a little bit counterintuitive in a way. If you think, gee, we could stabilize the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere if we would just hold our emissions constant. That's false. The amount will not stabilize as long as the input exceeds the outflow. So the only way to stabilize the amount, or in this metaphor here, this cartoon, the water level or the carbon dioxide amount in the air is by greatly decreasing the amount going in. In fact, by about 60, 70, 80%. If the goal were to stabilize carbon dioxide amounts. You can, of course, get the same result if you write down the differential equations and forget the bathtub, but this illustrates it. <laughs> so where we're left then is that we've got powerful observations that are showing significant changes since the late 1970s, maybe 1980, that the climate science observations and mathematical modeling are, are now high-stake operations. They need significant intensive effort and expansion, and that by all indications, limiting the emissions of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning is strongly advised, and similarly for the other greenhouse gases, because we don't really know where we're heading, but we're getting there fast. So I will stop there. Thank you.